Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. I know you might be busy right now. Maybe you're driving a tractor, or cleaning out your gutters. Maybe you're closing the pool, or painting a wall. But whenever you're done, whatever you're doing, please go to PayPal, at World of Warbirds B17. That's PayPal at W-O-W-B-17 and send some support. Now that I'm monetized over on YouTube and generating some revenue there, I have to justify still maintaining this audio podcast. So please, if you haven't done it already, help me out. And to all that already have, thank you. Where the P-38 really shone was in the Pacific. Twin engines were very reassuring over long water flights and the P-38 faults seen in Europe were not really present. Pacific commanders demanded as many lightnings as they could get. The Allison engines performed well in the warmth of the Pacific. The cold was not a problem. In fact, the cockpit being too hot was the problem. Partly because the P-38's window couldn't be opened without kicking up turbulence on the tailplane. Pilots often flew shirtless, wearing just shorts, sneakers, and their parachute. The P-38 could not outturn the nimble A6M-0 and other Japanese fighters, but its high speed and great rate of climb meant that it could dive in, blast the lightly armored or unarmored Japanese aircraft with a concentrated parallel stream of deadly bullets, and then climb away to do it again. In the Pacific Theater, the P-38 downed over 1,800 aircraft, with more than 100 pilots becoming aces by downing five or more each. So, did they ever solve the dive problem? This is what Kelly Johnson had to say about that. Open quotes. A broken ulcer over compressibility on the P-38 because we flew into a speed range where no one had ever been before. And we had difficulty convincing people that it wasn't the funny-looking airplane itself, but a fundamental physical problem. Close quotes. What was happening was not flutter, but compressibility. At high speeds, the center of pressure would move back towards the tail, push the nose down, and putting the aircraft into an uncontrollable dive. With jets, this phenomenon would be called Mach Tuck, the solution was to install dive flaps outboard of the engine nacelles. These were not speed brakes, but changed the flow of air in such a way as to retain the wing's lift. On April 9, 1943, a test pilot took a modified P-38G up to see if the new dive brakes would work. Guess who the test pilot was? Yes, Ben Kelsey. After climbing up to 35,000 feet, Kelsey started a dive. And at maximum speed, he pulled the lever to engage the new flaps. Nothing happened. Pulling harder, he broke the handle off. Then the aircraft lost one wing and the whole tail and entered a deadly inverted flat spin. Kelsey hit the silk and luckily only suffered a broken ankle. Finally, the P-38J models solved the compressibility problem with some electrically actuated dive recovery flaps which were located just outboard of the engines on the bottom center line of the wing. And these would extend downward 35 degrees in 1.5 seconds. Strangely enough, for an airplane that had so many teething problems, there were many, many variants of the P-38. The P-38's D and E were production models, and there was a proposed float plane version of the E that never went beyond testing. The F, G, and H models had provisions for carrying drop tanks or 2,000 pounds of bombs, had new radio equipment and automatic oil radiator flaps. The J had new chin radiators, flat bulletproof windscreens, power boosted ailerons, and increased fuel capacity as well as the dive flaps mentioned before. 2,970 of this type were built and some of these went on to be modified again to become Pathfinders or Photo Recon F5, C, E, and Fs. The L was the most numerous built and had many features that solved the P-38's vices. Firstly, it had the updated V-1710 
112, 113 engines, as well as being more powerful at 1600 horsepower, they dramatically cut down on the number of engine failures at high altitude. The L also had the capacity to carry seven high-velocity aircraft rockets on pylons that were placed beneath each wing. To eliminate the frozen pilot problem, the L featured a cockpit heating system consisting of a plug socket in the cockpit into which the pilot could plug an electrically heated suit for improved comfort. 3,923 of this type were built, most unpainted as per the new USAAF policy. However, 75 L's were painted black and modified to a night fighting configuration. They were installed with conical flash hiders on the guns and a radar pod was mounted below the nose. Somehow a second cockpit was jammed in behind the pilot's canopy for the radar operator. This place was pretty damn small, so short radar operators were required for this work. No account of the P-38s can be complete without mentioning the Droop Snoot. Because of the P-38's good range and bomb carrying capability, in 1943 it was proposed that they operate as level bombers to help out the B-17s and B-24s. The idea was to have a formation of P-38s led by a two-seat pathfinding P-38 with bomb sites. In 1944, Lockheed obliged and rebuilt several P-38Js by removing the armament, installing a transparent perspex nose with an optical flat panel, and a Norden gyro-stabilized bomb site. Armor plate was installed around the bombardier station. Although they look really strange with the B-17-like nose and bomb site, they were very effective at navigating and providing bomb aiming for formations of P-38s. Over 100 were modified to do this work. Some lightnings were used as crew and cargo transports in the Pacific Theater. They were fitted with pods attached to the underwing pylons, replacing drop tanks or bombs that could carry a single passenger in a lying down position or cargo. I'll include a picture of this, and I'm not sure if riding in this thing would be a thrill or a quick way to relieve constipation, or both. There was a proposal for a carrier-based version of the Lightning that would have had folding wings, an arrestor hook, and beefier undercarriage for carrier operations. The Navy thought that the Lightning was too big for carrier operations, and they also had a prejudice against liquid-cooled engines, so this plan didn't go anywhere. Pilots On the 14th of April, 1943, U.S. Naval Intelligence picked up a Japanese message addressed to the commanders of Base Unit No. 1, the 11th Air Flotilla, and the 26th Air Flotilla. It was encoded in the Japanese naval cipher called JN-25D, but, unbeknownst to the originators of this message, the U.S. had cracked this code and could read it. A program itself codenamed MAGIC. The message itself was pretty dull. It wasn't a plan for battle or an attack or anything. It was a travel itinerary consisting of times and places and transport details. Yawn, right? but the American codebreakers were excited nonetheless. It was not because of the trip itself. It was who was on it. Admiral Isoruku Yamamoto, commander of the Imperial Japanese Navy and the architect of the Pearl Harbor attack. The decoded itinerary laid out that in four days' time, Yamamoto would be flying in one of two Mitsubishi G-4M Betty bombers, escorted by six Navy Mitsubishi A6M-0 fighters. Takeoff time at Rabaul was 6 a.m., and they would arrive at Balalay at 8 a.m., Tokyo time. This information was pushed up the U.S. chain of command, and it may have gone all the way up to the President of the United States, who may have said, Get Yamamoto, although there is no record of this. We do know that Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox Admiral Chester W. Nibbets and Admiral William F. Halsey Jr. discussed the possibility of an attempt on Yamamoto. 
The main worry was that going after Yamamoto would reveal the existence of magic. And if the Japanese subsequently changed their code, that would be a major setback. But it was decided that this risk was offset by the possibility that a successful mission would be a body blow to Japanese morale. And they also figured that whoever would have to replace Yamamoto after would be less talented. The U.S. brass wisely decided that the source of the knowledge was to be kept from all unauthorized American personnel and the press. So, who was going to get the job? It seemed like a job for the Navy. After all, they were the ones who had suffered the most at Pearl Harbor and who are operating in the Pacific. But no. The F-4F Wildcats and F-4U Corsair fighters of the Navy and Marine squadrons on Guadalcanal just didn't have the range to hit Bougainville in return. The job would have to go to the USAAF, and more specifically, the 339th Fighter Squadron, 347th Fighter Group, who were operating P-38G Lightning aircraft. Along with drop tanks, they were the only ones with the range to intercept and engage Yamamoto's formation. Squadron Commander Major John W. Mitchell was chosen to lead the flight, and for this type of very long range over water navigation, Mitchell asked for a magnetic compass from the Navy, which was then installed in his P-38. These P-38s were equipped to carry drop tanks, but the only tanks on hand were the 165 US gallon type. Even with two of them, it wasn't going to be enough gas. Now, there were some big 330 U.S. gallon tanks in New Guinea, and these were flown up, and each of the mission's P-38s got one, giving them a funny look with one big drop tank on one side and one small drop tank on the other. Looks didn't matter. This would be enough gas to get them to the rendezvous point, and the tanks were located close enough to the aircraft center line to not cause balance problems. 18 P-38s were assigned to the mission. One flight of four was named as the Killer Flight to take out the bomber transports, while all the rest, including two spares, would be top cover. So how to actually get these P-38s to be in precisely the same area of sky as Yamamoto's plane? Mitchell worked out Yamamoto's flight plan and decided where he would be at 9.35. This is when the little formation would be beginning their descent over Bougainville, just 10 minutes before landing at Balalay. It was a good spot. It was where the Japanese would be at a lower level of vigilance. Pilots out there know that feeling. When you're about 10 miles out, you've essentially made it, and you just need to get yourself organized for landing. They probably wouldn't be as focused on the sky, looking for lightning to strike. Mitchell then worked backwards from that time, drawing four navigation legs, with a fifth going out in a search pattern, in case Yamamoto was not at the rendezvous point as planned. The formation would fly at wave top height, 50 feet, all the way to Bougainville to avoid radar and in total radio silence. Once the planes were ready and the plan was set, the crews were briefed about the mission. To protect the secrecy of magic, they were told a cover story about Australian coast watchers having spotted a high-ranking Japanese officer boarding an aircraft at Rabaul. There is disagreement over whether the pilots were told the name of their target, although some recalled being told that it was Yamamoto in order to provide additional incentive. The formation of P-38 started their takeoffs from Kukum Field Guadalcanal at 7.25 on April 18th. Two ships aborted, one due to fuel feed issues and the other one had a blown tire. The spares took their places. After two hours of flight at extremely low altitude, which was both nerve-wracking and tedious at the same time, in radio silence and following a very difficult navigation problem, the formation arrived at the intercept point at 9.34, one minute early. And there it was. Yamamoto's aircraft was descending towards the field in a light haze. The P-38s dropped their external gas tanks, 
bank to the right to fly parallel to the bombers and shove the balls to the wall in a full power climb to intercept them. Two planes did not follow. The tanks on Lieutenant Holmes's P-38 did not detach and his two-plane element turned back towards the sea. In the killer flight, Lieutenant Rex T. Barber banked his P-38 hard to get in behind the bombers and lined up behind one of the Bettys and opened up into its right engine, rear fuselage, and tail. Then Barber fired on its left engine, which began to trail smoke. The Betty rolled violently left and almost hit Barber and his P-38. The Betty augured into the jungle, causing a rising column of black smoke. Then he turned to look for the other Betty. They had to get both to be sure to get the target, whether they knew who he was or not. The other Betty had turned towards the sea and was bounced on by Lieutenant Holmes, who had gotten his tank to release. Holmes sprayed the right engine of the Betty with bullets and it started trailing white smoke. But Holmes and his wingmen had too much speed and overtook the Betty, taking them out of the hunt. But then Barber pounced, fired, and his bullets caused enough metal debris to fly off the stricken Betty that it damaged his own aircraft. But the Betty descended to crash land in the water. Some survivors actually climbed out of the bomber and were later picked up. But Admiral Yamamoto was not one of them. His body was later found by a search party. It had been thrown clear of the first Betty's wreckage. Yamamoto had been hit by two of the P-38's bullets. One had hit his left shoulder and the other had fatally punched through his left lower jaw and exited above his right eye. Although there was some unfortunate bickering over who had actually pulled the trigger on the Admiral, he was most certainly dead, giving America a huge morale boost and Japan a corresponding letdown. So far in this podcast, I don't think we've ever looked at a plane that was so problematic for so long in its development and yet performed admirably in so many diverse roles from fighter to fighter bomber to night fighter to level bomber photo reconnaissance, and even transport. It knocked down more Japanese aircraft than any other, which is kind of shocking considering that it was competing against Hellcats and Corsairs for this honor. Its fame grew partly because of the number of fighter aces that it created, including Richard Bong and Thomas Maguire, with 40 and 38 victories each. Charles Lindbergh, who was in the Pacific as a civilian observer, actually flew P-38s and actually shot down a Mitsubishi Ki-51 Sonya. Robin Olds became an ace flying P-38s in two missions in Europe, shooting down five enemy before his unit transitioned to P-51s. Another famous individual who flew P-38s was Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the French author of Night, Flight, Wind, Sand and Stars, and Le Petit Prince, The Little Prince, whose F-5B photo reconnaissance aircraft disappeared on the 31st of July, 1944. And the oh-so-distinctive P-38 itself disappeared from the U.S. Air Force's roster in 1949. Survivors Over 10,000 P-38s were built, and so there are many surviving P-38s. At least 26 survive today, and about 10 of them are airworthy. Probably the one with the most attention is P-38L, serial number 44-53254, that operates with the Flying Bulls. Until next time... <laughs>